Good evening. My name is Father Thomas Hurst. I'm the President Rector of St. Mary Seminary and University. And in the name of the entire Seminary University community, I want to welcome all of you to our annual Dunning Memorial Lecture, which this year is the inaugural lecture of the Raymond E. Brown Professor in Biblical Studies and Theology, Dr. Michael Gorman that Raymond E. Brown Chair in Biblical Studies and Theology was established at St. Mary's two years ago by the United States Province of the Society of San Sulpice in memory of an alumnus, a Sulpician priest, a former faculty member of St. Mary's, and one of the most distinguished Catholic New Testament scholars in the 20th century. Maybe just a bit of background information on Father Raymond E. Brown. Father Brown was born in New York City in 1928, and he grew up there with his family until they moved to Florida when he was a teenager. He later entered the seminary here in Baltimore, earned a master's degree in philosophy at the Catholic University of America, and he studied theology for ordination here at St. Mary's was ordained a priest in 1953 and joined the Society of San Sulpice at that time. His doctoral studies were both at the Johns Hopkins University, where he earned a doctorate in Near Eastern Studies, and then a second doctorate in theology from St. Mary's. His early work related to the Dead Sea Scrolls and to biblical hermeneutics. And after 12 years as a professor here at his alma mater, he moved to Union Theological Seminary in New York City in 1971, where he remained until 1990, when he took up residence at St. Patrick's Seminary, another Sulpician seminary in California. In all of these years of teaching, he produced exegetical commentaries on the Gospel of John and the letters, comprehensive studies, and the biblical testimony of both the birth and the death of the Messiah. In addition, he wrote numerous articles and monographs on various aspects of New Testament theology, preaching, and the priesthood. His last major work was the introduction to the New Testament in 1997, one year before his death. In addition to his scholarship, Raymond E. Brown was also an ecumenist and was recognized internationally for those gifts. He served for 25 years as the only American Catholic member of the Faith and Order Commission of the World Council of Churches. In all of this, Father Brown was a man of great fidelity. First, fidelity to the biblical text as the revealed word of God, fidelity as a disciple of Jesus, and fidelity as a Sulpician priest dedicated to priestly formation in the life of the church. St. Mary's is deeply grateful to the Society of San Sulpice, represented here tonight by the American provincial, Father Thomas Olshafer, who is also a student of Raymond Brown, deeply grateful to the province for their gift of the endowment and the establishment of the Raymond E. Brown Chair in Biblical Studies and in Theology. Now I'd like to invite Reverend Dr. Brett Latham, the new Dean of the Ecumenical Institute of Theology, to, to introduce the Raymond E. Brown Professor in Biblical Studies and Theology. Brent? As I prepare to introduce uh, my predecessor and the new Raymond E. Brown Chair, I, I want to follow his example and begin by asking, how many of you have never been here to St. Mary's before? How many of you are here for the first time? We want to extend to you a special welcome and, and say thank you for coming, and uh, we hope that uh, you'll learn more about St. Mary's, about the Ecumenical Institute of Theology, and that your, stay, your, your time with us will be enriching. Our format tonight is a scintillating lecture, followed by a brief but exhilarating time for questions. And after the lecture, in it, there will be an additional book signing outside in the hallway, which is thanks to our friends Hearts and Minds Books, 
uh, who have a lovely display in the hall and are, are selling all of the books there at 10% discount. Um, tomorrow, you're welcome uh, to register at the door if you haven't already and come spend the morning with the Apostle Paul, uh, in addition to Paul, uh, who will not probably show up in the flesh, uh, <laughs> but will be channeled by Dr. Mike Gorman, Drs. Mike Gorman, Richard Hayes, Kathy Grebe, and uh, Father Thomas Stegman. Uh, we are so excited about our conversation uh, with the Apostle Paul tomorrow morning, 8.30 for the book signing, 9 o'clock for the, uh, the conversation. This is the annual Dunning Memorial Lecture, and it's made possible by the uh, first endowment gift that was ever given to the Ecumenical Institute of Theology around the year 71-72. The first Dunning Lecture occurred in 1972. We have had a parade of distinguished Dunning Lecturers over the year, but tonight I call attention to one of the most, probably the most notable, the ninth Dunning Lecture, Father Raymond E. Brown, whose lecture was entitled Diversity in Early Christian Communities. Uh, the, the holder of the Brown Chair, our lecturer tonight is Dr. Michael Gorman, he is the author, co-editor, or co-author of 11 books, dozens of scholarly articles and chapters, and dare I speculate, hundreds of presentations and talks. He also teaches Sunday school class regularly at his church. In recognition of the significance of, of his contributions to the field of New Testament, this past summer, Dr. Gorman was elected to the prestigious Studiorum Novi Testamenti Societas which is an international society whose aim is the furtherance of New Testament studies. Mike is also my immediate predecessor as Dean of the Ecumenical Institute, so I literally watched a DVD of him doing this for <laughs> Dr. Ellen Davis a couple of years ago. In light of all his scholarly accomplishments and well-deserved recognitions, I think that I find myself most amazed that in the office which I inherited from Mike, sit two wingback chairs, well-worn from the vast parade of students, co-workers, friends, and prospective students with whom Mike has been willing to sit and talk and listen in friendship and guidance. He is, in my estimation, a living exegesis of a properly cruciform humility. So please join me in welcoming our new brown chair for his inaugural lecture, which is titled, the Death of the Messiah, Theology, Spirituality, Politics. Thank you all very much. Thanks to Brent and to Father Hurst for that generous introduction. Make sure you can hear me. It's a pleasure to be here. I don't know which is more fun, doing the introductions or being the introduced, but uh, we have another distinguished Dunning lecturer in our midst this evening. I'll mention his name in just a moment. But I need to begin at the beginning, which is to give thanks to Father Hurst and to Father Olshafer and to the Sulpicians for both honoring me and humbling me with this appointment. It's not something that I believe I earned, so it is definitely um, salvation by grace or appointment by grace, which is a great Pauline theme, as we all know. So I'm delighted and grateful for this opportunity. Uh, since the announcement of my appointment a year ago, I've received numerous affirmations, not only of my own contribution to this work, but especially uh, of the impact of Father Brown on people across denominational and theological spectrums and really across the world. I was in England this summer and at a conference and had a number of people say to me how they had appreciated his work or his lectures or both over the years. So I'm delighted uh, and honored to be able to share something of his name. I also want to draw attention to some special people who are here this evening before I actually begin my lecture. First of all, from my own family, my wife Nancy is here and my son Brian in the front row. And then also the panelists for tomorrow are here, uh, Father Rob Stegman, who's over here, Dr. Kathy Grebe from Virginia Seminary, uh, Rob is from uh, Boston College, and then on my left over here, Dr. Richard Hayes, who also was a Dunning Lecturer, Dean of Duke Divinity School, and was here uh, 
probably 15 years ago now to do the Dunning Lecture. Yeah. Um, also, uh, not but least, last but not least, my good friend Andy Johnson, another New Testament scholar, is here. He surprised me today showing up from Kansas City for this event. I'm really glad for that. All of these people are special to me in a variety of ways, and I've been most influenced, I have to say, by Dean Hayes of Duke Divinity School. My gratitude to him both personally and professionally is profound, and I would not be here for his, without his encouragement and help and friendship over the years. Having said that, I also exonerate him from any and all blame associated with this talk tonight. <laughs> it's all on my shoulders, Richard. So. Well, and thank you for coming uh, on a Thursday night when you could be home staying warm by the fire. Here you are, and I'm grateful to you as well. The purpose of an inaugural lecture is, at least in part, to indicate where a scholar has come from and where he or she is going. That will certainly be true this evening. The title of my lecture comes from one of Father Brown's monumental works of scholarship, his two-volume Death of the Messiah, published in 1994. Although he and I approach this subject of the death of the Messiah from very different angles, as witnessed by my subtitle versus his, mine is Theology, Spirituality, Politics, his a commentary on the passion narratives in the four Gospels. Like so many others, I am indebted to his zeal for scholarship that is readable and that serves the church as well as the academic guild, and I hope uh, in my work to meet those goals as well. But my focus this evening is not Father Brown's focus. Rather, it is, at least in that book, it is rather the theological and existential dimensions of the death of Jesus, the one whom Christians call Messiah and Lord. I will this evening propose a new model of the atonement. It is not brand new, however, as I've already published one article on it. I'm currently completing a book on the subject. And I've also recently discovered that a few, though a very few, other people have explicitly suggested a similar model. Most importantly, moreover, I believe this model can lay claim to being the original understanding of the atonement. That ought to send some shockwaves somewhere. Um, I may be wrong, but at least I think it's an important one. But back to that point, in other words, we are recovering this evening, not creating. And in my way of thinking, that's a better way to do Christian theology anyhow. So this is a not-so-new model that we're going to be considering this evening. First, I will highlight some problems with existing models of the atonement and sketch out the new model. Second, I will speak about some of the new model's spiritual and ethical dimensions. And then third, I'll make some brief comments about the political dimensions of the model. In other words, as the subtitle says, theology, spirituality, politics. I intend this lecture and the greater lifelong project of which it is a part to be an exercise in both biblical and constructive theology, hence I'm grateful for the name of my chair. Please keep in mind, however, that one hour is hardly enough time to grapple thoroughly with such a complex topic. Some opening observations about the death of the Messiah before we launch into part one. I hope everybody has a handout. It will pretty much walk you through where we're going. In this lecture, I will use the term the cross as shorthand for the death of Jesus. So three preliminary points. First of all, because Jesus was crucified as a religious leader who was a threat to the political as well as the religious status quo, we should never forget that the cross was and always will be an event with both religious and political implications. Secondly, Neither the death of Jesus nor any of its many interpretations by Christians has any value or validity apart from God's resurrection of the dead Jesus. Paul recognized this already in the 50s, speaking most eloquently about it in 1 Corinthians 15. Jesus' death on a Roman cross is the death of the Messiah only if God raised this Messiah from among the dead ones. And thirdly, the New Testament witness about the cross is that it tells us not only something about Jesus, but also something about God. The great German biblical scholar Ernst Kasemann famously said that the cross is the signature of the risen one. That is, the risen Lord remains the crucified Jesus. I would add that the cross is also the signature of the eternal one. The cross is not only a Christophany, in other words, but a theophany. It reveals what Christ is like 
a divine self-revelation telling us what God is like, gracious, merciful, and self-giving. It's tempting to spend the rest of the evening just talking about those three points, but I'm not. I'm going to, to move on as promised in the title. So on then to theology of the cross as atonement. How many images of the atonement, the saving death of Jesus, are there in the New Testament? Many Christians assume there's only one, something like Christ died for us and our sins as an act of what's often called substitutionary atonement, one dying in the place of others. In most recent interpretations of the New Testament, however, the answer is many interpretations. Over the centuries, theologians and students of scripture and of the atonement have often suggested that these various images coalesce around three basic interpretations or theories or models, which is my preferred term. First is satisfaction. It's often associated with sacrifice or punishment. Secondly, Christus victor or Christ the victor, meaning Christ's death as victory over sin and evil powers. And third, moral influence, that is Christ impels us by his example to respond in love to God and to others. Some prefer to separate sacrifice from satisfaction and call it a separate model, so we have perhaps four basic models. In recent years, however, these have been supplemented by a variety of new models and by recognition of older models that are not as prominent as the big three or the big four. For instance, in his book, Triune Atonement, Christ's Healing for Sinners, Victims, and the Whole Creation, Andrew Sung Park prefaces his own contribution, which is in the title, Healing, with a review of eight theories, five traditional and three more recent. Um, we could go through the list, but I won't right now. Another scholar, David Brondos, in his Introduction to Salvation and the Cross, considers the role of the cross in 10 more general soteriological models, both from the ancient church and more recently, and then he groups them into four uh, categories. Peter Schmeichen, another theologian, also groups 10 theories of atonement into four general categories. Now, what's interesting about this sort of cottage industry that's going right now of creating more models of the atonement is one theologian actually reviews eight and then proposes five of his own in the same book. But what I have noticed over the years is what is lacking in all these proposals is anything like a model of the atonement called the New Covenant or even the Covenant. The New Covenant model, that there's no such theory or model, in my opinion, is something of one of the great wonders of the theological world. After all, according to the Synoptic Gospels, all three of them, this appears to have been Jesus' own interpretation of his death on the night before he died with Luke probably making explicit with the word new that which was implicit in Mark and Matthew. And I think you have these on your handout. This is my blood of the covenant, my blood of the covenant poured out for many. The, this is the cup poured out for you, the new covenant in my blood. Moreover, in the only canonical, canonical account of the Last Supper outside the Gospels, Paul passes on the same kind of tradition we find in the synoptics, especially Luke, indicating that both the Last Supper and the present act of its remembrance, the Lord's Supper, narrate an interpretation of Jesus' death centered on the establishment of a new covenant. That's on your handout as well from 1 Corinthians 11. The scriptural overtones in these accounts are rich, plentiful, and somewhat diverse. There are references to blood that are obvious echoes of the Passover sacrifice in the Exodus, which is an event of liberation. There are echoes of... Uh, implicit or explicit forgiveness of sins, suggesting that Jesus' death fulfills the day of the atonement in Leviticus, and also inaugurates the new covenant promised by Jeremiah in chapter 31. We'll come back to that. That includes liberation and forgiveness. That is, Jesus' death is the means by which the people of God are liberated, forgiven, and brought into a new covenant with God. We'll come back to this quite obviously. My main point for now is that despite its apparently great significance to Jesus, the evangelists, and Paul, New Covenant, or even Covenant, is not all that significant to the Christian theological tradition in its metaphors and theories and models of the atonement. This insignificance is seen not only in the lack of a New Covenant model, but also in the scarcity of New Covenant language in most discussions of the atonement, even on the rare occasions when its importance or centrality is acknowledged in principle. 
So, for instance, David Brandos, in the book that I mentioned, identifies the creation of a new covenant community as the main New Testament understanding of the atonement, but he doesn't develop it. Joel Green, a good friend of mine, in what he calls a kaleidoscopic or multifaceted approach to the atonement, briefly emphasizes the Last Supper as a point of entry into our understanding of Jesus' death, rightly states that Jesus developed the meaning of his death out of the hope of a new covenant, and then leaves it right there. So, new covenant language appears in Paul not only in the context of the Last Supper, but also in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, but not in these models of the atonement that so many people have been working with. I think this is not on your handout, so I'll read it briefly from 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Paul says, not that we are competent of ourselves to claim anything is coming from us. Our competence is from God, who has made us competent to be ministers of a new covenant, not of letter, but of the Spirit, for the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. Paul describes this new covenant as one characterized by the Spirit and by glory, but references to Christ's death are not far away, and they are throughout 2 Corinthians, especially close to chapter 3 and chapters 4 and 5. In other words, the ministry of a new covenant is, a profound, is in a profound sense a representation of the death of Jesus, both in lifestyle and in words. And this ministry of the new covenant is part of an even greater divine mission, namely new creation. I could cite Pauline texts where this connection is made. He says we're afflicted. In 2 Corinthians, that is, we're afflicted in every way but not crushed, always carrying in the body the death of Jesus so the life of Jesus may be manifest in us. Uh, if anyone is in Christ, there's a new creation. Uh, we make an appeal to you. Be reconciled to God for our sake. He made him to be sin who knew no sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So Paul's ministry of the new covenant is a ministry of the death and the life-giving death of Jesus. Thus, for Paul, the event of Jesus' death, and it's implied his resurrection, inaugurates both the new covenant and the new creation, of which the new covenant's a key component. Then, of course, moving from Paul to Hebrews, Paul did not write Hebrews, by the way. As Origen said, only God knows. <laughs> Who wrote Hebrews, that is. Uh, the word covenant there appears 16 times, as Kathy Grebe would know, writing on Hebrews at the moment. Um, the the Word is there. Jesus is described as the mediator of a better covenant, a new covenant, an eternal covenant affected by his blood and his death. This new covenant is what Jeremiah promised, a promise that Hebrew quotes twice, the, uh, the first of which is the longest New Testament quotation of a scripture text in it. These facts alone, it would seem to me, justify a theory or a model which is the language, again, I prefer, of the atonement that we could call effecting the new covenant or simply new covenant. But to repeat myself, that model is almost completely missing. Now, time does not permit me to argue the case tonight fully, but I want to say this clearly. I do not think that the reason for this lack of a New Testament or a new covenant metaphor is that it's lacking in the New Testament. The word, the phrase may not be there a lot, but the concept is, and I'll come back to that a little bit. So then, we have a need for a new and more comprehensive model. Apart from the sheer weight of the evidence, there is a need for a new model for the new atonement, for at least, for the atonement, excuse me, for at least four reasons, which I think I've outlined on your handout. First of all, the existing, especially the traditional models, tend to be isolationist or even sectarian in character. Each one is constructed as a kind of standalone theory that supposedly tells the whole story and requires the exclusion of other versions of the story. Only rarely, as in the case of a great theologian like Colin Gunton, the late Colin Gunton, does a theologian try to appropriate and integrate various models. Secondly, is the atomistic and non-integrative character of these models. These models. They don't naturally pull together other aspects of theology into their orbit. Atonement, however understood, often stands apart, separated from ethics, spirituality, ecclesiology, pneumatology, missiology, and of course, politics. Now, in some cases, atonement becomes a narrow branch of theology that is so narrow it's almost irrelevant to the actual life of Christian individuals and communities. The third problem, I think, is individualism. 
the traditional models have a nearly exclusive focus on the individual rather than on both the individual and the community as the beneficiary of the atonement. Uh, theologian and New Testament scholar Scott McKnight in a book called A Community Called Atonement and others like him have also recognized and begun addressing this problem. This individualist emphasis is rather odd considering that the New Testament repeatedly speaks of Jesus dying for the sins of a body of people, whether the world, John 1, John 3, the nation, John 11, or simply us, Romans, 1 Corinthians, Revelation, etc. The fourth problem we might call underachievement. That is, the models do not do enough. We may summarize a model of the atonement in terms of its understanding of the fundamental effect of the cross on a person or on a group, on humanity. In the satisfaction substitution penal models, the effect is propitiation, the staying of God's anger, expiation, and or forgiveness. In the Christus Victor model, the effect is victory and liberation over sin or Satan or powers. And in the moral influence the mo model, the effect is inspiration. In the New Covenant model I will propose this evening, the effect is all of the above and more. But that effect is be best expressed not in the rather narrow terms of the traditional models, but in more comprehensive and, and, and integrative terms like transformation, participation, and recreation. So there you have it. In my estimation, a set of isolationist, non-integrative, individualistic, underachieving models of the atonement. What kind of Christians, what kind of church are such models, uh, models of atonement likely to produce? More recent interpretations of the atonement have been proposed by those who have seen similar or other problems with the traditional models. Although time does not permit a review of these proposals, to the degree that they offer a more comprehensive, integrative, transformative, participatory, missional interpretation, I'm all for them. This does not mean we have to discard the past. We have to integrate the past with perhaps some things that are in need of recovery. So we move for a few minutes to the prophetic promise and the outline of a new covenant model. The phrase New Covenant only appears once in the Old Testament, Jeremiah 31, 31. But this is clearly a classic case of the importance of weighing items rather than counting them, at least when it comes to this and determining significance. If Paul's a reliable guide, it appears that at least one other prophet, Ezekiel, wrote about the same future reality. For in 2 Corinthians 3, Paul blends the language from Jeremiah 31 Ezekiel 11 and Ezekiel 36, and you have those full texts on your page. The book of Ezekiel, full of covenant language and the hope of, re of a renewed people in an everlasting covenant with God, implicitly, in my mind, sanction sanctions this merger. We will therefore briefly look at the relevant portions of these three chapters, these three passages, as guides to the prophetic promise of a new covenant, first articulated during the exile. The relevant passages on your sheet are from Jeremiah 31, Ezekiel 11, and Ezekiel 36, and then we'll come back to one other. I'm not going to bother to read these, but simply to highlight a few phrases. Um, in Jeremiah 31, make a new covenant with the house of Israel and of Judah. Uh, I will put my law within them, in verse 33, I will write on their hearts, I will be their God, they shall be my people. That's traditional covenant formula language. Uh, verse 34, they all shall know me, for I will forgive their iniquity. Ezekiel, gather you people, so there's integration and, and unity. Uh, verse 18, they will remove all its detestable things. 19, I will give them one heart, a new spirit within them. Verse 20, so that they might follow my statutes and be my people, and I will be their God. Ezekiel 36, the nation shall know, in, ver in verse 23, shall know that I am the Lord, says the Lord God, when through you I display my holiness. Uh, verse 25, you shall be clean from all uncleanness. Verse 26, a new heart, a new spirit. Verse 27, spirit within you so you can follow my statutes. 
In addition to these three texts, there's also an interesting text from Ezekiel 37 where God says to the prophet, I will make a covenant of peace with them and it will be an everlasting covenant. So when we read these texts canonically and in light of the fact that Paul seems to draw on all of them in some way, there is a kind of united witness that we can describe as a transformative, even creative act that generates a renewed covenant people of God. They experience are, and are characterized by a, a series of what I call, I guess, adjectives about them. And I've listed these, I think, as well for you on the, um, on the handout. They are liberated, having experienced the new exodus. They are restored and unified, that is, Israel and Judah are together, gathered from the peoples with one heart. They're forgiven. They're sanctified, set apart. They exist in a mutual covenant relationship with God in this uh, community-wide faithfulness. They're empowered from within to live this covenant out by the spirit or the law within them. Um, they bear witness to Yahweh's holiness they are peace-filled. They're people of shalom and of security. And this is a permanent arrangement. So I think we can summarize this new covenant in these nine adjectives that are listed for you on the handout. It's a comprehensive vision, to be sure. But I think it's the conviction of the New Testament writers that the death of Jesus the Messiah has accomplished all of these things and thereby inaugurated this new reality, this new covenant. John Carroll and Joel Green, two uh, well-known New Testament scholars, have said this about Luke's account. The cup after the meal is a metaphor for a new covenant enacted through the blood Jesus spills, quote, on your behalf. Jesus here interprets his death as an event enabling a new covenantal loyalty, a gift creating a new covenantal community. His self-sacrifice, they continue, is a means of benefaction for the community of his followers. Here, Carol and Green point out at least two significant elements for which I'm arguing about this transformational understanding. The creation of a new covenantal community and the enabling of new covenantal loyalty. Of course, the, the understanding of this new covenant and of the community is going to be dramatically affected by the story of Christ especially by the fundamental claim that it is his death by crucifixion that brings about this new covenant. That is to say, the cross of Christ does not only effect the new covenant, it affects it. It refracts it. It even fractures it, as one scholar, Roy Harrisville, has said. So we have a reconfiguration in the New Testament of this prophetic vision. A couple of examples. Covenant faithfulness and holiness expressed in the love of God and neighbor will now take on a cross-shaped or cruciform reality. Sacrificial self-giving, perhaps even to the point of death. Another point, perhaps, this reconstituted community will not unite only Israel and Judah, but Jews and Gentiles. The gift of the Spirit will be closely associated with the work of Jesus, so, such that the work of the Spirit will be in continuity with the work of Jesus. Students in my Gospel of John class will know we've talked about the Spirit as the alter Christus, the alternative Christ, the alternative paraclete even, who comes following Jesus' death and ascension. Now how does this play out in the New Testament? That's a whole course, not an evening's lecture. Uh, but there are different permutations and combinations. I'm not arguing for um, uniformity, but rather an overarching presence in the New Testament of these and similar elements grounded in the prophets, but now refracted through the lens of the cross. Three elements are particularly striking to me. First, the death of Jesus creates a people, not merely a host of individuals. These are not on the handout, but let me read you just a couple of texts. First Peter says, once you were not a people, but now you are God's people, you having been sprinkled with his blood. Or in Revelation, see I don't just read Paul. Uh, in Revelation, to him who loves us and freed us from our sins by his blood and made us to be a kingdom priests. Second thing that strikes me, this newly formed people is animated by God's indwelling spirit in a remarkable way. Throughout the New Testament, 
The spirit is the divine force that empowers people to believe and then to embody, even when persecuted, the good news of Christ crucified. We see this in the synoptics. We see it in John, Paul, Hebrews, 1 Peter, Revelation. And third thing that strikes me is that the community of the new covenant fulfills the law, meaning especially the, especially the double commandment to love God and neighbor. A consistent theme throughout the New Testament is the reconfiguration of the double commandment to love God and neighbor. This is the law of God rewritten on the heart. Configured, I said, should say reconfigured by the cross of the Messiah, especially to include enemies and empowered by the Spirit. Again, time does not permit too many examples, but three that are not printed on your handout. Famous one, Mark 10. Hear, O Israel, Jesus says, right? You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and your neighbor as yourself. These are the two greatest commandments. Or go to James. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to care for orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself unstained by the world, for friendship with the world is enmity with God. Notice you can't help widows and orphans and stay out of the world, but the point is to be, as John would say, in the world, but not of it. Or 1 John, we know this, sorry, we know love by this, that he, Christ, laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for one another. How does God's love abide in anyone who has the world's goods and sees a brother or sister in need and yet refuses help? Those who say, I love God and hate their brothers or sisters are liars. For those who do not love a brother or sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. Even the prohibitions in the New Testament reflect this fundamental two-table covenant. For instance, in Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, he uses the word flee two times. Flee immorality, especially sexual immorality, and flee idolatry, the horizontal covenant and the vertical covenant. Or James, with it, the tongue, we bless the Lord and Father, and with it we curse those who are made in the likeness of God. Doesn't make sense, right? From the same mouth, James says, come blessing and cursing, my brothers and sisters, this ought not to be so. More broadly, I think we could look at entire sections of the New Testament, such as Jesus' farewell discourses in John 13 to 17, and perhaps even the corpus entirely of Paul's writings as texts that tell us that the cross is a community-creating event, a new covenant community-creating event. It's the divine act of creating a new covenant people. John 13 to 17, we've just done in my uh, Gospel of John class, and they will know what I think about this, which is that Jesus is here setting up a new covenant community. It's a community marked by intimacy and covenant keeping, loving one another and being loyal to God, even in the face of persecution, empowered by the paraclete. The word covenant does not appear, but everything else about the covenant does. It's as if God is saying, we, Father, Son, and Spirit, will be your God, and you will be our slash my people. Now, some theological advantages of this approach. You might be thinking, okay, New Covenant, how could we not have New Covenant? It's called the New Testament. What are some advantages of, of referring to it or constructing a model of, of atonement around it? I've listed these on the hand that I'll be very brief. I think it is, first of all, more comprehensive and integrated. It allows for other models of the atonement. This is at the bottom of page one. It allows for other models of the atonement to be brought in, whereas the others tend to be isolationist and non-integrative. This one is just the opposite. And it brings in ethics and spirituality, ecclesiology, and even politics. There will no longer in this model be a rift, a possible rift even, between faith and works, evangelism and social justice, spirituality and politics. Raise your hand if there's been a rift in those in other places. Okay, you're with me. In Methodist church, you would say amen. So, all right. They're all related and integral. Secondly, the New Covenant model incorporates and integrates other aspects of other models of the atonement. We don't have to be exclusive. Traditional theories tend to be, although not always, but in my opinion, they also concentrate too much on the mechanics of atonement. How exactly does Christ's death effect salvation? I would suggest that the New Testament writers are far less interested in mechanics of atonement than they are in the results of atonement. 
In fact, I would suggest that the mechanics are largely a mystery and will always be precisely that, which is why we need so many metaphors. To some, however, my claim that the New Covenant model is less interested in the mechanics may be seen as copying out. So let me try to exonerate myself. I haven't copped out. I do think we could say something about the how of atonement in this model. If it's about recreation, if it's about the indwelling of the spirit, if it's about becoming a new people and enabled to keep the covenant of God, then it seems to me that the best explanation of this is through something that we call participation. The new covenant model, therefore, contains within it an implicit impulse to move us in the direction of participation as the way in which we benefit from this covenant uh, renewal. Thus, the how of atonement would be to participate in that faithful and loving death of Jesus on the cross. A participatory model is not new. It goes back to Jesus. I'll argue even to Paul. I mean, to, it goes back to Paul. I would argue even to Jesus. I'll come back to that. And it's certainly prominent in the early church and is being revived today. But even then, the how is mysterious. We can't explain it completely. Thirdly and briefly is the communal emphasis. I think I've said enough about, enough about that tonight. This is not to discredit the importance of individual faith. Don't misunderstand me. It's not to discredit it, but to contextualize it. It's, it's individual faith into a larger reality and a larger reality that incorporates those individuals into it. Fourthly, the centrality this model gives to the spirit is completely, uh, to me, completely important because if the other models only underachieve, then this has the possibility of achieving that which the new covenant said it would do. So the spirit is critical to this model. And with that, I proceed to point to part two, spirituality. Are you with me? We're good? Okay. I will have to be briefer about spirituality and politics, but I will um, do my best to say something for you to think about. The word spirituality itself is open to various definitions, even in the context of Christian faith. For many people, including Christians of various kinds, even the word spirituality sends shivers up their spine because it connotes an experience of the transcendent or even of Jesus specifically that's unconnected to life in the world. Its purpose to transport people out of the trials and tribulations of this world through mystical experiences or an interiority that's almost narcissistic and so on. You've probably all heard the phrase, he or she is so heavenly minded that he or she is of no earthly good, right? Now, recent scholarly interpretation of Christian spirituality dismisses this as completely inappropriate, but it's not dismissed from our spiritual pop, popular spiritual writings and even from Christian music, both traditional and contemporary. My organ-playing son would be proud of me for getting a little dig into contemporary music there, but it's traditional music sometimes as well. To speak of Christian spirituality is to speak about something this worldly, not escapist and nar not narcissistic. And to say that is, first of all, to make a theological claim about the Christian faith itself. My teacher at Princeton Seminary many years ago, in his inaugural lecture there, which was called the This Worldliness of the New Testament, made some important points along these lines, which I would now like to quote. His name was Paul Meyer, a very distinguished New Testament scholar. He contends that for the earliest Christian communities and for us, the very this worldly crucifixion of Jesus as historical fact, as God's means of redemption, as hermeneutical or interpretive key, renders Christian faith inevitably this worldly. For the New Testament writers, everything they know about God and life, he contends, quote, has been stamped with the branding iron of the crucifixion. Isn't that a nice phrase? He continues, all has become irreversibly this worldly because the transcendence and authority of God now underscore and authorize that this, this, that this worldliness. And, he says, there's something on the stage of history that was not there before, a community that calls itself by the name of the crucified Messiah. 
It is one that can say now with integrity that it, it, that it has been brought into being not by a flight into another world or by visions of things yet to be, but by its experience of life and by God's confirmation of the same. Now back to the question of spirituality. One standard definition of it is the lived experience of Christian faith or of Christian faith and discipleship. This is useful, but others have suggested it's not doesn't quite go far enough. So another recent proposal, and a, a well-received one, is a transformative relationship with God. In our context, I'd like to amplify that just a bit. I think it's on your handout too. Spirit-enabled, this worldly, transformative participation in the life-giving death of the Messiah, such that the cross is not only the source, but also the shape of our life in the new covenant. I would repeat that, except it's already on your handout, so. But that's how important I think it is. It is, in other words, our theology of atonement embodied in daily life. Catholic circles, the Paschal mystery in daily life. Sandra Schneider, who's well known in, in uh, this area, uses that terminology in a similar definition. The prophets, before we say the prophets, um, if you're in music, you may have heard the phrase, when we sing, we pray twice. We could add to that, when we live, we theologize twice. The prophets had indicated that the new covenant would be one in which the law of God would be inscribed within the people so that they could do God's will, God's spirit. Thus, life within the new covenant involves an intimate union of ourselves with the very self of God. It is participatory. Now, I believe this, this actually goes back to Jesus. And I've got on your handout the saying from the Gospel of Mark in which he speaks about a baptism into his own death. Beginning at Mark uh, 10, 38, Jesus said to them, you do not know what you are asking. Talking about when they, this is the argument where they say, can I be on your left, can I be on your right? Jesus said, you do not know what you're asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink? We have similar language in the Gospel of John, chapter 18. Or to be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? They reply, we are able. There's even a hymn based on that text. Jesus said to them, the cup that I drink, you will drink. And with the baptism with which I am baptized, you will be baptized very different kind of baptism and um, so forth than they would have expected. Paul's letter to the Romans echoes this, I think. Chapter 6, verse 3 of Romans, Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore we've been buried with him by baptism into death. James Dunn, another Dunning lecturer here some years ago, has argued on several occasions that the metaphor of baptism into Jesus' death or originates not with Paul, but with Jesus. In other words, Jesus calls us not merely to be followers, but to be participants, specifically participants in his death. No one, to my knowledge, has articulated this more clearly than Dietrich Bonhoeffer in his famous book, the Cost of Discipleship, or the original title simply, Discipleship. The Romans passage reminds us of another metaphor or reality in Paul's letter, uh, namely in Galatians, about being co-crucified with Christ in Galatians 2. This in turn brings us back to the synoptic accounts of Jesus summoning his disciples to take up their cross. When Jesus, according to Mark, invites them to be participants in his baptism, what does that mean concretely? I think Mark tells us, organizes Jesus' teachings in such a way, that there are three concrete worldly spiritual practices, each one associated with the passion predictions that are outlined by Jesus in Mark 8, 9, and 10 and picked up by the other synoptic writers. These three are fundamentally the following from Mark 8, courageous self-giving witness to Christ in the gospel. From Mark 9, hospitality to the weak and marginalized, represented by children. Power, number three, as service to others rather than domination. And all three of these with the possibility of suffering. 
In addition to these three, I want to add something from Paul's letters, which the rest of the New Testament affirms, including the Gospels, that peacemaking, the covenant of peace, as Ezekiel would put it, is integral to the life of the new covenant. So, fourthly, peacemaking and reconciliation. These themes constitute a kind of reconfiguration of the double commandment to love God and neighbor, expressed now in radically new ways shaped by the cross. They don't exhaust the new meaning of the covenant, but they do offer us a significant starting place. So I'd like to briefly talk about these four spiritual practices before showing their connection to politics. The first passion, each of these, by the way, is followed, follows on a passion prediction, a prediction that Jesus makes of his upcoming suffering and death. To save space and not give you two pages of a handout, I've just compacted the sayings. Um, in Mark 8, famously, uh, Jesus and Peter banter. Um, Dr. Hayes calls it a mutual rebuking contest, which is one of the most lovely lines in a very wonderful book, but one that I always remember. Um, Jesus does not explicitly accept his title of Messiah here, but it's clear that he does, and he does so by redefining it, not in terms of power and glory, but in terms of suffering and death. It is clear, too, that the disciples acknowledging Jesus as the Messiah will require a dramatic intellectual and personal conversion, conversion of their imagination about what Messiahship entails, and a conversion of themselves in terms of discipleship to this Messiah. As Richard has remarked, when we embrace Mark's answer to the question, who do you say that I am, we are not just making a theological affirmation about Jesus' identity, we're choosing our own identity as well. Now, if time permitted, I could show you a very careful study of this text and a similar text in Paul's letters in Philippians chapter 1, in which the language is almost identical in terms of what it means to be a disciple and suffering out of the possibility of um, the gospel and, and Jesus the Messiah. So this is an intentional habit of reliving his story, participating in it, in new ways, in their own situations. It's the call to what Joel Marcus, a commentator on Mark, calls a living death. Doesn't sound too fun, but according to Jesus, it's the alternative to a different kind of death. And this is in the context of public testimony as, as the passage suggests. So this sort of understanding of Christian spirituality, I would suggest, pervades most of the New Testament, from Matthew to Revelation. That's why one scholar some years ago called the New Testament a martyr's canon, a collection to inspire and to encourage potential martyrs to remain faithful. Second spiritual practice. The second summons in Mark 9 also evinces the disciples' misunderstanding of what Jesus is up to, their fixation on greatness. And we learn from Jesus what this is going to mean for discipleship to him. So it's going to mean hospitality to the weak and the marginalized represented by these children. When Jesus embraces the child, it is what some people call an enacted or a living parable. The child here, contrary to Mark 10, is not an example to be imitated, but a person to be cared for. In antiquity, children had little status and significance, especially outside of Judaism. Although Jews valued children as real human beings to be cared for, in Greco-Roman culture and law, children were not persons but possessions. No legal rights, victims of exposure, infanticide, abortion, and all kinds of other mistreatment that Jews and then Christians rejected. Here, though, Jesus elevates the status of a child by embracing the child, who is a representative of children, but also of all who are weak, marginalized, and non-personed. In other words, Jesus in this text calls his disciples to personize or neighborize the non-person or the non-neighbor. And in so doing, they are becoming like Jesus, and in becoming like Jesus, they are becoming like God. Because, as Psalm 46 and many other texts tell us, that the Lord lifts up those who are bowed down, the Lord loves the righteous, the Lord watches over the strangers, he upholds the orphan and the widow. 
So the second spiritual practice. The people of the new covenant are those who dare to covenant covenants with those whom others regard as non-covenantable because they're not neighbors or they're not persons. Let those who have ears hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. Jesus proclaims that such hospitality to the powerless is in fact hospitality to him, Matthew 25 as well, and ultimately, ultimately to God the Father, as we see here in Mark 9, 37. Again, we see this throughout various parts of the New Testament. Third, we've already looked at this text briefly. Here we have a focus on greatness or power understood as service to others, not only to the weak and the marginalized, but to all. And in this prediction and in the summons to discipleship, there are a variety of very significant things, especially the language of power, which would be a very good translation into, uh, transition into politics, which we'll come to momentarily. But notice once again the participatory nature of this reality, this practical participatory theology. One of the most significant aspects of it is precisely that. And what Jesus offers his disciples is not a seat of glory, but a vocation of service. Sharing in the mindset of greatness as service that will even suffer for others rather than lord it over them like the Romans, the Gentiles. The disciples are called to share in Jesus' lordship, not by acts of lording, but by acts of self-giving and serving. Fourthly, peacemaking. We draw here not directly from Jesus or the Gospels, but from Paul. But I would say that Jesus was also a peacemaker. In New Testament theology and ethics, we have not paid enough attention to this part of the New Testament. There's a great book called Covenant of Peace by a scholar, Willard Swartley, who's tried to rectify this situation, and others, including some present in this room, have done so as well. In 2 Corinthians, we learn that God is about the business of reconciliation and passes that messenger, that ministry on. Kathy Grieb has written a wonderful article about this, by the way, who's present here with us this evening. As Colossians puts it, through Christ, God was pleased to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, by making peace through the blood of the cross. It's the centrality of peace in the New Testament should make the term peace churches redundant. Unfortunately, however, the term peace churches is not redundant. In fact, I'm embarrassed to say this, but I think it's unfortunately true, too often the term peace churches is closer to being oxymoronic than to being redundant. Well, what does this have to do with politics. I am not going to tell you how you should have voted. Don't worry. Let me conclude with some remarks that might connect these practices of spirituality to politics. What do I mean by the word politics? One possible definition, which is uh, sort of in the tradition, is the structuring of human life for human flourishing. But the New Testament's clear that we, who call ourselves Christians, are already part of a politic, of a kingdom, a political entity unlike any other. So for our, excuse me, for our purposes, I mean this by politics. If spirituality is our theology embodied in daily life, then politics is our spirituality embodied in the public square. It's our public life together. Three quick preliminary observations and then some comments on the four practices. First of all, the New Testament makes it clear that Christians, people of the New Covenant, are part of an alter culture, A-L-T-E-R culture, an alternative culture. That is, we are a politic before we have a politics. Our primary political activity is to be the church and to be the church unashamedly in the public square. Secondly, the primary group identity of all members, all members of the New Covenant community, is that they belong to their common Lord and our brothers and sisters across the globe. That is to say, our first allegiance can never be to the nation state. In other words, the death of Jesus means for his followers the death of every form of nationalism. 
Christians are like resident aliens, as the Epistle of Diognetus said already in the second century. Any country can be our homeland, but for us, our homeland, wherever it may be, is a foreign country. Thirdly, for all kinds of reasons, members of the New Covenant community should operate with a hermeneutic or an interpretive posture of suspicion vis-a-vis -vis the powers. After all, as Paul says, it was the powers who didn't know what they were doing when they crucified Jesus. As the Gospel of John tells us, Pilate is standing there with truth incarnate in front of him, and he says, what is truth? Readers and hearers of these narratives should know what Raymond Brown said, that the tables are turned and Pilate, not Jesus, is the one who's really on trial. Now, you might be expecting that I'm going to say the logical conclusion of this line of thinking is that the Christian community should just go off by itself in a little holy huddle. I'm not going to say that at all. That this worldliness of the cross and of Christian spirituality will not let us draw those conclusions. Members of the New Covenant community are still to seek the welfare of the city, Jeremiah 29, 7, written to people in exile. But this, must, this good they seek must be in cruciform mode. Our lives should not, I'm sorry, our lives should be a living presence and voice that reflect the cross of the crucified Messiah. This is not, I would submit, the way politics and Christians normally unite. If politics is at least in part about the exercise of power, Christians have far too often sought to share that power to control the political and or public realm and even to participate in the exercise of power in ways that are antithetical to the cross. You could start the list for me. The Crusades, the cross-lighting so-called of the KKK, and even today the contemporary merging of crosses and American flags. So, Another Dunning lecturer, N.T. Wright, has written this about Revelation, the book most critical of pagan culture and politics. The church, he says, is to live as the alternative city, not by separating itself into sectarian isolation, but by bearing witness. The aim is not to damn, but to redeem. The leaves on the tree in, the, in Revelation are for the healing of the nations, and the gates stand open for the kings of the earth to bring their treasures. So N.T. Wright. But he says, because the world needs, super, needs structures of power, but power corrupts, the church must, quote, bear witness against that corruption by critique, non-collaboration, witness, and if need be, martyrdom. Thus, the cruciform political life will resemble, in fact, it will be a natural con continuation of the cruciform spirituality we've already examined. So, number one, a politics of truthful witness, speaking and embodying the truth in love, like a Martin Luther King, or like a Pastor Andre Trocme in the village of Le Chambon during the Second World War, in which he hid Jews um, at great expense of, uh, of great risk, I should say, to him and his communities. And as he did so, he said, what we do, we will do without fear and without hate, speaking and embodying the truth in love. Secondly, a politics of servanthood rather than power and control. For those of us who live in the world's only superpower, there's special uncruciform temptations to avoid and, and special cruciform tasks to embrace. I won't go into detail. Number three, a politics of hospitality and solidarity rather than rejection, especially with the vulnerable and the suffering. Again, André Trocmé in Le Chambon. When he was asked by the authorities, do you have any Jews living among you? And he did, 5,000 to be exact, more or less. Do you have any Jews living among you? We know you do. They replied, nous ne connaissons que des hommes. We only know human beings. Fourthly, a politics of forgiveness and reconciliation and shalom. I think of the Truth and Reconciliation Commissions. I think of the Amish community in Nickel Mines, Pennsylvania, that sectarian bunch that suddenly became the example to all of us of Christian forgiveness, and so on and so forth. Well, we've come to the end of our time and my glass of water. 
You have been very patient and very good. Let me briefly conclude with the key words on your handout and then with one final thought. The new covenant model that I'm proposing is above all integrative, joining various realities together. Secondly, it's about the creation of a liberated, forgiven, and transformed people. Thirdly, it's about a this-worldly spirituality rooted in the very gospel. We might refer to it as an exteriority of the interior. Fourthly, it is itself a kind of politics, a way of being in the world but not of the world. And finally, and most importantly, in this model, the atonement produces not merely beneficiaries, but participants. The cross is not only the source, but also the shape of our salvation. Christ's death effected the new covenant, meaning specifically the creation of a community of forgiven and reconciled disciples, inhabited and empowered by the Spirit to embody a new covenant spirituality of cross-shaped loyalty to God and love for others, thereby participating in the life of God and of God's forgiving, reconciling, and covenanting mission in the world. I believe that this kind of holistic, communal, participatory, and missional model of the atonement is precisely what the church needs to appropriate, articulate, and actualize. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gorman. We now have time for the uh, spirited exchange of questions and answers. We're not going to let Mike rest, but bring him right back up. And we've got a wireless mic. Uh, we're going to give uh, Dr. Gorman the prerogative of identifying the persons uh, around the room, and, and we'll run the mic to you. And to assist with that, he'll, he'll say uh, a name or a point, and then identify the person after that as well. All right, any questions that you would like to pose? There's one there. I don't, I don't see who it is if I even know them. Is there another one so we can get two persons lined up? All right. Oh, wait. Wait for Patty so everybody can hear you. Yeah. And Dr. Gorman, it's, it's Adam. Oh, Adam, hello. Yeah. Um, you, you talked about that um, it's grounded in the prophets and refracted through the cross. As, as, a, as a pastor, as, as church leaders, can we, um, do you think in, in this, on the bottom of page two, when you talk about the four dimensions of this, this new covenant politic, do you, do you think there are seeds of this in the prophets that it was grounded in? I mean, can we, can we use Absolutely. the prophets to teach this new politic? Is it? I mean, I know it's refracted through the cross, but I mean, do you think it's still relevant to use these, especially Ezekiel and Jeremiah, to teach this to the, to the churches? I would say Ezekiel, Jeremiah, and beyond. I mean, I, don't, I think many of those, these themes, um, courage and hospitality to the weak, and even this understanding of, of giving for others, is rooted ultimately in the prophets. So yeah, uh, I quoted Psalm 146. You could find similar texts in lots of the prophets in Isaiah and Micah in uh, Amos. So, yeah, I, I think very much there's a, a rootedness in the prophets um, which we would want to celebrate. And, wanna, and, and that's one reason why I think uh, Jews and Christians can work together on so many um, political or social realities if they um, base their work in their common scriptures. Uh, you think of Abraham Joshua Heschel, for instance, the great spiritual writer of the Jewish tradition, marching with Martin Luther King, just as an example. Now, we don't, we don't all have that opportunity to be out in public and do great things, but I think absolutely um, that would be a critical thing to do, to keep them together. Thank you. Great question. There's one way up here. Maybe, um, Dick, why don't you go ahead? and If anybody else has a question, raise your hand so we can. Okay, there's one coming up here too, Patty. Those two there will be good. Um, Dick, why don't you go ahead with your question while Patty's coming up. I'll try to repeat it, and if that doesn't work, we'll give you the microphone. Mike, under number four, peacemaking and reconciliation, what about nonviolence? 
Yes. Um, it's implicit in this. I didn't make it explicit, not because uh, the question. Sorry, the question is in under number four on the um, practices. I didn't specifically mention nonviolence, peacemaking, and reconciliation. I think, in many ways, uh, the teachings of Jesus and the cross uh, point us in the direction of nonviolence. And I would say, in, an, in a rather absolute way, I'm on the same page here with uh, several other people in the room who are. Uh, well known in this field, including Dr. Hayes, uh, saying that there's not a syllable, for instance, in the Gospels or the New Testament that would support the use of violence on the part of Christians. I was a deliberately a little um, more general here so that I was hoping to create uh, a common accord and then we could discuss maybe some areas where there might be reason to disagree on the means of peacemaking and reconciliation. That's really where Christ the only place where Christians ought to be able to disagree if the means is open for discussion, perhaps. Um, but the goal of peacemaking and reconciliation, and I would say, unfortunately, oftentimes in the Christian tradition, we have been um, almost drunk with sacred violence in certain circumstances, that perhaps I should have been more explicit about that and more forceful about it, but I would agree with the principle in general, and I would hope uh, that all of us would agree in general, and many times we'd agree in the specifics that this is uh, uh, nonviolence is the Christian way. Yeah. Thanks for the question. Um, Patty, there was one here. Hi, I have questions about um, the implications of what you've said for polity and for liturgy. Okay. Um, in particular, thinking about uh, the New Covenant as a cross-shaped community, one of the areas of um, ecumenical tension has been an understanding of the Eucharist as should it be considered primarily a meal or primarily a sacrifice. I wondered if um, it, it seems to me what you've said here would imply that there's real strong uh, push to consider and, and bring out the sacrificial aspects. So I wondered if you agreed with that and also uh, what implications for church polity this new covenant has. Okay. Um, well, Vicki did a lot of reading in Paul this summer from an ecumenical perspective. So. Um, I'll, I'll take that as it, partly a follow-up to our conversations of the summer. Uh, as I've said throughout most of the evening, there are multiple metaphors of and interpretations of the death of Jesus in the New Testament, and we need to embrace that multiplicity, in my opinion, and in the opinion of most people today, I think. So I would not want to rule out the death of Jesus as a sacrifice for sins, um, and I might even be willing to say that there's something, now remember, I'm not a Catholic theologian, uh, something sacrificial in some sense about the activity of celebrating the Lord's Supper. If you read my interpretation of the Lord's Supper, the Eucharist, in my book, Apostle of the Crucified Lord, in, in interpreting Paul there, I don't use sacrificial language there. But it does seem to me that there's a multiplicity, even in that little passage in 1 Corinthians 10 and 11, of interpretations of Jesus' death, such that uh, conversation about that should be pretty wide-ranging and pretty open. On the other hand, it does seem to me that in the same way that the church is wise in not having a particular doctrine of the atonement in the creeds, there may be other things that we don't have particular doctrines of in the creeds for good reasons. And there may be a variety of things in that department. So um, I'm not willing to, I, I, don't, I think we should explore more fully the possible implications of that, but I fully respect those who uh, would feel differently in that regard. With respect to polity itself, I think you've got, polity follows from theology. So you've got to get the theology conversation on the same track before you can make any difference in how you actually run churches and how people can commune or not commune together. Do you want to follow up? Yeah. Um, you have covetous theology. Yeah. Can you, can you elaborate that theology and say what polity do you see flowing from? 
Probably not on the spot because I haven't thought through that completely. Um, the question was, can I, now that I've proposed a theology, can I go next step and propose a polity? Probably not on the spot, unfortunately. But it would move in ecumenical directions, to be sure, rather than in increasingly exclusivist or mutually exclusivist directions. It would certainly move in that way and would embrace, I mean, if there's a variety of metaphors to embrace, um, for instance, the Eastern tradition, which is experiencing a revival in this interest in uh, participation and in divinization theosis. I mean, those kinds of things are not only about theology, they're about practical life. So there are going to be practical uh, conversations and, and the consequences, but I'm not prepared to say anything specific. Sorry. I don't know where Patty got to, but I saw a hand over here. Was there one back that way? Okay, yeah, Audrey. Um, I was very interested in your comment uh, or, or your, your perception that you are recovering uh, a tradition instead of creating one. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to ask you to comment on how we may have lost that tradition, particular, particularly um, in relationship to our development of the creed, where we went from the birth immediately to the passion and kind of skipped the ministry. Um, and and um, how do you see this recreate the, this recreating that you're finding, or this recovery that you're finding, uh, owing to the flowering of biblical scholarship in the 20th century that kind of brought the ministry more in line? Well, the f first thing I would say is I don't think we should be too critical of the creeds because, as Tom Wright always says, they're not meant to be a syllabus. Uh, they're not an outline of ST601, so to speak. That, that wasn't their function. Um, I think the, in, in, with respect to the atonement, the creed is great because it doesn't give us a theory, even though theories were emerging, if you will, at that time, or models were emerging. If I were going to place the blame anywhere, I think I would place it perhaps about a thousand plus years later, well, into the medieval and early Reformation period where um, either a satisfaction model or a penal substitution model took hold in a way that became rather exclusivist. I think both of those models can be recovered in the 21st century as well, and there are people working on that. I don't want to exclude those models. So I don't know that placing blame on a particular either creedal formulation or even on a particular theological development is... Um, the best way to go. When I'm talking about recovery, I'm thinking of many of the particularly Eastern, but also some of the Western traditions that have been largely ignored, not, ex not totally ignored, but largely ignored in more recent Protestant scholarship in particular, the last couple hundred years, and that that's now being recovered. For instance, Luther, um, Luther's doctrine of union with Christ which would be very amenable to what I'm talking about tonight in terms of a, of a community that's unified in uh, Christ and together we, be, we become little Christ's, uh, his exegesis of Philippians chapter 2. That aspect of Luther has not been as prominent until some recent recoveries of that dimension of Luther. So I think those kinds of recoveries are the result of ongoing biblical and theological scholarship, but... Uh, that doesn't mean we see 2020 in our own day either. Nobody, nobody does. Um, I'm sure if anybody reads this paper in 100 years, they'll find flaws in it, uh, or even this kind of conversation that I think is emerging. But it's a great question. I just don't think placing blame gets us too far in this. Um, we need to integrate and incorporate. There's a, uh, I think that, Man back there had his hand up, Patty, and then up to here next. Yeah. Oh, Alan. Yeah. All right. <laughs> yes. Uh, when you speak of uh, the new covenant model, and I think of covenant uh, as a relationship between God and us, uh, does that mean that? in your mind, the, um, uh, the cross, uh, the soteriology of the cross really becomes more 
a part of theology rather than Christology? And does that matter? A very good question. Uh, I would say the cross has always been a part of theology and Christology. When that is separated, we get into dangerous waters. And I see Reverend Dr. Hayes nodding in strong agreement up here, so I'll say it again. They always were together. They should, they should be together. When we separate them, we get into trouble. I remember a conversation about this some years ago with Miroslav uh, at an event that Miroslav Wolf was speaking at. And a similar question was raised, and what Miroslav Wolf said, and I would repeat, is we need to keep in mind that uh, the atonement and God's reconciliation is primarily to be understood as a two-party system, a two-party endeavor, God in Christ reconciling the world, rather than God punishing Christ in place of the world, which would be a three-party system. Now, to be sure, there are texts in the New Testament that say God sent the Son, God made the Son sin. I'm not dismissing them or disputing them, but ultimately, when we think theologically about this, if we completely separate Christology and theology, we end up, I think, in, in serious difficulty. So yes, this does say a lot about God. And it does say something very significant about, as I mentioned at the very beginning, about the cross being not only, and the New Testament witness is clear about this, not only something Jesus did, not only something God did, but it's something, we, it's, on one page it says Jesus did it, a verse later or a page later God did it, and then we see them in cahoots, which is the way it ought to be because theology and Christology should be inseparable. I hope that addresses your concern. I don't know where the mic is, Patty, here. I think Alan up front had a question, and then we've got time for maybe, well, we've got, oh, we've got a few minutes. Uh, thank you, Dr. Gorman. It's always a pleasure to hear and uh, sit under your feet. Um, I'm, I'm drawn uniquely to your um, definition of spirituality embodied in the uh, public square. I, I come to that because I just left a rally where persons were protesting uh, the redirection of funds for youth jail. Uh, for that for, for Instead of building the jail, oh, to redirect the funds. Uh, I come from a community, Upton community, to this community. The life expectancy of a child is 20 year difference, child born in that community and this community. So the challenge I have as I look at your question of spirituality embodied in the public square is that in the context of what happened Tuesday to where we are this Thursday, I think we haven't really come to spirituality as truth. So that we have a deficit, I believe, in this whole truth context because people do not perceive truth from a Christology, they perceive it from their own political perspective. So I just wonder if you had a comment on, if you're going to use spirituality as in the definition, spirituality has to imply truth. And then how do we get to the aspects of truth? Absolutely. Uh, well, spirituality, as I've defined it, is related directly to what we as believe as Christians as the most fundamental truth of our faith, namely that God in Christ God in the Messiah has begun the process of reconciling the world. That's the that's one aspect of the ultimate truth, if you will. And um, to the degree that our politics, as the public expression of our spirituality, corresponds to that reality, that truth, our politics will be good politics. That doesn't mean we're always going to agree. Uh, there's a lot of twists and turns along the way, and um, we need to come at this, I think, as Christians, um, in a kind of new spirit of dialogue. I don't know if any of you heard about the movement across the country to have a communion service Tuesday night after the election. It was pretty widespread. I think it began in a Mennonite community and then kind of went viral on Facebook. I, as you heard in my presentation, I don't think the first politics that we as Christians have is American politics or any other national politics. Our first duty is to live for and embody the kingdom of God, the, the reign of, of the Messiah. Um, but we certainly do need to um, speak with one another to identify, okay, now that we agree on that, 
what are the kinds of things that ought to come out of that reality, that truth? And I'm not going to you know, make statements about any public officials or any public policies. That wouldn't be my place tonight. But I don't think, as Christians, we usually, or at least many of us don't, think through these issues from the critical perspective of the cross. Kazeman, who I quoted earlier, said, the theology of the cross is always a polemical theology. That is to say, when you start talking about a cruciform politics, everything's up for grabs for a moment. Everything's under the scrutiny of, of the cross, of, God, of the God revealed in the cross. There's an old saying from the church in Latin, crux probat omnia, I think, if I got my Latin right. The cross, um, give me a good English word, Rob. Thank you. Tests everything. Probes everything. Well, let's, let's get started probing. Um, and as you know, I've preached in your church. I know your community a bit. We've been colleagues in, in various ways over the years. I, there's a discrepancy there, not only between Tuesday and Thursday, but between those two communities. Patty, where is the, are we out of time, Dr. Latham? One, one, more, one more question? Uh, is that Rich Gula back there? Okay, if you would take that too. Mike, I first want to thank you for being able to give us a, a, a very fine understanding of the biblical text but be willing to move beyond the Bible to its political implications. And we don't always get enough of that. I'm struck in your presentation of how you moved from your biblical interpretation to spiritual practices. Uh, listening to you from a Catholic ear, when I hear spiritual practices, I think immediately of devotions. Mm -hmm. And when I hear a Catholic audience wanting to enhance their spirituality, they tend to mean they want to engage in more spiritual practices or alternative spiritual practices. And I was struck by your interpretation or use of spiritual practices was in the language of ethics. You chose the language of virtue, hospitality, service, mm -hmm. courage. <clears throat> So my, my question has to do, you, I, I didn't hear a lot of ethical language in your presentation as you move from the Bible to spirituality. So do you have any thoughts on the relationship between the moral life and spirituality? Uh, is, the, is spirituality really the public face of morality? Uh, or is morality the public face of spirituality? Maybe both. So the Catholic institution, so I tend to be both and rather than either or, Rich. But in, in, in serious response, though, I think earlier today in the colloquium with the faculty, I was asked the question, what have some of the influences been on me after 20 plus years in a Catholic institution, me as a, as a Methodist, as a Protestant, um, for whatever that term Protestant is worth in, in this context. But um, we don't have a department of spirituality and a department of morality here, or moral theology. They're, they're mixed. Is that still true? Yeah. Father Kobicki should know. Yeah, thank you. And it seems to me that um, they are so closely integrated in the Catholic tradition, at least as the way we define them um, as a department here, that they are closely connected. So that I certainly would not want to discount the intimacy of spiritual devotions that enhance our sort of direct uh, love for God. And I, I don't think I said anything explicitly, and I didn't even mean to imply that those are unimportant. Um, rather, what I'm trying, I think, to do in, in this presentation is to suggest that uh, the cross calls us to a kind of devotion to God that gets expressed in the public realm. And I think that that is both spirituality and, as you said, virtue ethics. So maybe they are, like theology and Christology, are a lot less inseparable than we tend to make them be. 
you're the ethicist, so come back with a comment or, or a rejoinder. No, that's another Dunning lecture. Thanks. <laughs> Are you looking for an invitation? <laughs> okay, well, thank you for the question. Thanks to all of you for your uh, questions and for listening. That's another Dunning Lecture. This was indeed a wonderful Dunning Lecture. We thank you, Dr. Gorman, and invite you to recognize that your, your night's labors are not finished. Uh, you've agreed to uh, go back to the book signing table, which is out in the hall, and folks will want to, to greet Mike and thank him for the talk and, and express your goodwill. But again, thank you for coming, and we, we wish you Godspeed as you uh, finish here and depart. Go in peace. <laughs>